Hi, before I get started, I want to tell you you're doing a great job. I enjoyed reading your paragraphs. I enjoyed re reading your discussion boards, and I'm excited to see what you're going to write next. But before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about a concept called rhetoric. And you might be familiar with that phrase if you have been in high school recently. But if you haven't, you might be wondering, what is rhetoric? And so I asked a few friends who don't teach writing, what do you think of when you think of rhetoric? And I asked them to enter it in on a word cloud, and these are the responses they got, they gave me. Rhetoric is manipulation. Rhetoric is persuasive speech. Rhetoric is just words. It's strategies. It's all about politics. It's lies. It's empty talk. The word that they came up with the most is it's about argument. Now, that leads to the question, what is argument? Well, an argument is not that back and forth thing that you do with somebody you're mad at. Well, it is, but not in our context. In our context, an argument it is a reason or a set of reasons given with the aim of persuading other people that an action or an idea is right or wrong. In a text, it's the author's main assertion. It is the main point of the text. All of these pretty much say the thing. It's this idea that somebody wants to persuade somebody else. E. Shelley Reed had an argument in her article, 10 Ways to Think About Writing. Just moving my head over there. Um, and if we're gonna write about an argument, we would introduce it with this phrase. E. Shelley Reed argues that and I want you to think about it for just a minute. What is her main point? She spends 23 pages talking about writing, talking about writing in a way that most of you found interesting, some of you found surprising, some of you found enlightening, but every idea fit together under the same argument, the same main point. And so I want you to think about it. What is her main point? This is how I wrote it. E. Shelley Reed argues that although writing will always be difficult, when we write for real people and think about what they will need in order to understand our ideas, we will figure out ways to do it. Honestly, she is all about that. She says, don't write for a teacher. Writing is a real thing. It has real purposes. And if we want to persuade people, if we want them to think our ideas make sense or they're interesting or they're worth considering, we have to figure out how to do it for a specific audience. Now, if you've been taught that you just write for a general audience for everybody. I'm gonna change that up a little bit this semester because I want you to envision real audiences, groups of people who actually might read what you're writing about. E. Shelley Reed talked about that being a primary audience. For example, if you wanna write borrow money, she says you would ask your best friend differently than you would ask your parents or you would ask a bank. You'd have different reasons, you'd give different details, you would use different language if you wanted to persuade. It all depends on who you're talking to. Reed's point is that you need to know who you're writing for, what they care about, what kinds of things appeal to them, what kinds of concerns they have, and then you have to know what you want to say and why it matters to you and know how you want your audience to respond. 
And then in your writing, you respond to what the author cares about, give concrete examples that include things they can relate to, and pay attention to their concerns. In other words, write about what you know about, care about, are passionate about, are curious about, it's worth writing for. Show, don't just tell, and show the things that your audience cares about, and then adapt to your audience and your purpose, because that's what matters. And she says, if you use those three principles, if you do those things, your writing will have a, finally have a fighting chance of being real and not just rules. And that's when writing gets interesting and rewarding enough that we do it, even though it's hard. It will always be hard. She says, these are some of the hardest concepts ever. But if we have something to say, something that matters to us, and we think about our audience, we'll figure it out because it will matter. That isn't so very different. She calls that writing rhetorically. And that's not so very different than what Aristotle said. Aristotle was a philosopher who was writing in ancient Athens in about 323 before the Common Era. And he defined rhetoric as the ability to determine the available means of persuasion. Again, there are lots of things you could do, but you adapt them for specific audiences. What are the possible means of persuasion? Which ones do I choose to connect with this audience. Richard Weaver talks about it a little differently. He's a rhetorician, that's a person who studies rhetoric, and he says rhetoric moves the soul with a movement that cannot finally be justified logically. All things considered, he says, it's a great power in the world, and rhetoric at its truest seeks to perfect people by showing them better versions of themselves. As in, we can change the way people think to get them to do things more ethically, more honestly, better. Of course, better depends on who you are. Um, Kenneth Burke, and you'll read something by him, um, uh, Gerald Graff and Kathy Graff, Kathy Birkenstein actually quote him in the section you'll be reading of They Say, I Say. And Kenneth Burke goes a little darker. He says the most characteristic concern of rhetoric is the manipulation of people's beliefs for political ends. Yep, to um, shape attitudes and induce actions in other people. And that's where that manipulation idea or lies comes through but it doesn't have to be that. And in this class, we don't want that. We want ethical arguments. And you'll be making some of those arguments and you'll be reading some of those arguments. How does rhetoric work? Well, it's like this, which is pretty much what E. Shelley Reed said. The author or the speaker or the artist communicates in a way that connects with the audience using word patterns, stories, evidence, metaphors, emotional language, comparisons, logic, statistics, images, sounds, designs, and more to produce audience responses that make the author or speaker or artist's main point seem more reasonable, more persuasive. As many strategies as you can think of, things that you actually do to connect with an audience, you can get the audience to respond in ways that they go, hmm, maybe she's right. Or maybe that idea makes sense to me. Now, Aristotle, back to him again, he observed that where there were three main audience responses, and these are known as rhetorical appeals not to be confused with rhetorical strategies, but we'll get to that point on another day. Um, the three main audience responses are ethos, pathos, and logos. And ethos is when the audience responds by saying, oh, that author, that speaker is so trustworthy. 
pathos is when the audience starts to feel an emotion. Um, and logos is when the author audience says, whoa, that makes sense. So Aristotle, back to ethos, which is the trustworthiness of the author, Aristotle said that the audience is more likely to trust the author if the author seems knowledgeable, like they know what they're talking about. They're also more likely to trust the author if the author seems to share their values, has experienced the same types of things. Um, they're also more likely to trust the author if the author seems concerned for the audience. Think about E. Shelley Reed. She seems knowledgeable, she's a writer, she's writing well. She really seems to share the values of the audience of first year college students. She seems to understand their experiences. Um, and she definitely seems concerned for them. So she does that with her language, with her stories, with her examples. And she's doing that throughout the text. You all wrote a lot of really good stuff on that. Um, two other things that um, Aristotle talks about. He says, if the author seems fair, seems objective, or just seems good, then we're more likely to trust them. And it could be a combination of these things, not just one, not just two, doesn't need to be all five, but some combination of things. We're more likely to trust an author or a speaker or an artist. Artist, Why is ethos so important? Why is it important that we trust the author? Well, if we don't trust them, we're gonna look at them and saying, are they telling the truth? Hmm. And if we do that, we're not gonna believe what they say. So the next rhetorical appeal is pathos. And pathos isn't just, we can't just say the author, the audience is pathos. No, we have to think about the emotion that the author is trying to bring up or produce in the audience. Think of a whole range of emotions, guilt, an author might tell a story to make the audience feel guilty or to make them feel empathy or to make them interested or to make them feel curious or to make them mad. And so you see, I'm naming all kinds of emotions here. And so you want to think, what is the author doing and how does the author want the audience to feel? That's what pathos is. Now, Evidence is not the same as logos. And yes, I am sure. Think of E. Shelley Reed, the jello and the arguments, or the fruit jello and plain jello. It's like the fruit is sort of the evidence. And she says, if you just throw the cherries on the table at a potluck, people will go, why is it there? Similarly, if you just take plain jello, people go, hmm, well, that was boring. And so she says, you've got to combine the evidence with the arguments, the claims, and then you get something interesting. That's logos, using logic or reasoning to make the argument seem true. Now, right now, remember that any of the authors that we're reading have an argument. They're trying to persuade you of something. As you try and figure that out, think about who their primary, primary audience is, what you know about that audience. Sometimes you'll be the primary audience. You definitely were with E. Shelley Reed. You will be with um, They Say, I Say but you are not the primary audience for Callie Lindforce, Joy of Survival, the Literacy, the Hill Strang Hillside Strangler, and anything extra you know, we know. Um, she has a different audience, but more about that later. 
Um, so think about who the uh, primary audience is and what you know about that audience. Think about the author's main point, the author's main purpose. See if you can write that in a sentence. And then think about what the author is doing in the text to persuade the primary audience. That's all I've got. Have fun reading, and I'll have fun reading your writing. Bye-bye.